Uh, we are at the top of the hour, and this is the Future Trends Forum. Welcome, everybody. My name is Brian Alexander. I'll be your host and guide to the next hour. I'm the creator of the Future Trends Forum, and I'll be happy to introduce it. I'm absolutely delighted uh, to welcome Justin Reich. Justin is a professor at MIT, uh, where, and he is the author of a really, really important new book, Failure to Disrupt, a very, very powerful book about education and technology. And that's going to be the subject of our conversation today. If you'd like to learn more about the book, if you don't have a copy, or if you'd like to grab one directly, look at the bottom left corner of the screen. You'll see a kind of tan colored button that says Failure to Disrupt. Press that, take you to the page, and you can grab a copy. Now, let me bring Justin up on stage. Welcome, sir. Can you hear me okay? Very well. It's good to see you. Nice to see you too. Thanks for having me, Brian. Well, a pleasure. And I'm glad to see your beard is growing. It, every day. Yep, that's right. It's a key part of the forum. We're openly, openly biased towards beards. That's an important thing. Uh, where are you coming to us from today? Are you in Cambridge? Uh, no, I'm in Barnard, Vermont. Um, everybody who does, uh, MIT tried to de-densify very early on like everywhere else. And so the people who are on campus do things with fume hoods and nuclear reactors and wind tunnels. And those of us who just do stuff with computers were told to bug off and we did. Um, so I'm actually in Barnard, Vermont, um, which is a town of about 800 people right in the middle of the state. That's a big town. How, uh, how much snow is on the ground? Finally zero. Um, we had our uh, we had our thesis day maybe a week ago Friday, and it was the last big storm of the season with about a foot of snow. Um, so I just uh, turned Zoom on my phone and hopped onto the mountain and skied down and listened to graduate student thesis presentations. Every once in a while, I have to ski to the side to safely have to ask a question and then hop back <laughs> on the trail. That is a Vermont story. <laughs> On the internet, no one knows you're a skier. <laughs> did you get any good selfies? No, no, no. You, I mean, just, I, I, did, I did maintain a very low profile. See, that'd be your next book check at cover. Yeah. The, uh, um, you, there are a lot of ways that people in academia can introduce themselves. And the, and the way we do it here in the forum is, is we ask you to say what you're going to be working on for the next year. You know, so what are you going to be writing? What are you going to be researching? What are you going to be teaching? And what are you going to be thinking about? There are a lot of answers to those questions because I'm lucky to work with a big team, interdisciplinary team of cool folks. Um, but I, the main thing we're working on um, is that as we've looked at the sort of instructional design palette that online educators have, yeah. um, we feel like there's a real missing piece around simulation and practice. Um, this is particularly acute in teacher education, which is my er main area of interest. Um, when teachers learn, they listen to people talk about teaching and they talk with each other about teaching, but they very rarely do teaching. Um, so we built a tool called Teacher Moments, um, which you can look at at teachermoments.mit.edu. Um, and uh, it's a digital clinical simulation platform that immerses people in vignettes of classroom life um, through text, audio, and video. Um, and then periodically a microphone icon pops up or a text box pops up and you have to say what you would say to a person in that moment and make some difficult decision in teaching. And there's all kinds of uh, data capture that lets us, you know, um, learn about how people are authoring scenarios, how they're participating in the platform. We just added some functionality to have sort of intelligent coaching agents come in. Um, so it was sort of our effort to say, okay, here was here was what we think was one missing building block in the instructional design palette that we have. Let's see if we can try to to build something that fills that in. Um, and make it available, you know, under an open source license. So a, a, a big part of what we're doing now is that I don't know, we have a community of practice and maybe a hundred people in various places that have started to to adopt this tool, and we're trying to figure out how to how to support them and have that uh, grow and scale. It's fantastic. Uh, I hope everyone gets a chance to uh, play with this. Uh, and Roxanne, thank you for uh, uh, putting that in the link. Do you uh, what behind the uh, uh, all the content, um, do you have uh, an algorithm that just randomly generates this or do you have a kind of narrative structure for the no, it's all It's all authored. Um, so, the, so the back end of Teacher Moments, it's like a combination between Google Slides and Qualtrics. Um, in, in fact, you know, we might not have built it, except neither of those platforms has really good audio input. That turns out to be like the killer app or, or the killer feature. You know, what, what we want is you're, you're in some scenario, 
and a, and a kid calls you a racist and we want the microphone icon to pop up and we want you to say, not, we, we don't want you to describe what you would do in that circumstance. We want you to actually use the words that you would say and have them recorded and hear them back. Um, we have, we, we have some colleagues um, in neuroscience medicine, the, uh, a Yale professor who runs the, the National Neuroscience Education Center. Um, and uh, apparently there are some uh, drugs that can be prescribed for opioid abuse, which are dramatically underprescribed. Um, and it's the same kind of thing. Like, don't tell us what you would say, the exact words that you would say to a patient suffering from opioid disorder when you're going to suggest to this patient that you're going to prescribe this particular medication that has the stigma associated with it and stuff like that. Um, but anyway, the, 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 I, I got derailed from your question, which is, uh, you know, the, the way the content appears um, is that we make partnerships with folks. Um, one of our partnerships is with 15 computer science teacher educators across the country, people who are starting new programs to help middle and high school teachers be licensed as computer science teachers. And they think to themselves, like, what are the situations that I want my students to be able to practice in a simulation before they practice them in real life? Um, and then the tools are very, very simple to author. Um, and so, um, you know, there's a bunch of, there are a bunch of these scenarios that we make, but mostly people make scenarios for their own local context. Um, and, a, you know, a big part of some of this will connect into maybe some stuff we talk about later. Um, there are a whole bunch of people who have, who have built simulation tools and they're like, oh, we should build it with a VR headset and or, or in augmented reality or in all these sort of complicated ways. Um, and we want people to be fully immersed in everything that's happening in teaching. And there's potentially some good reasons to do that. But there are two big problems. Um, one is most institutions that train teachers um, don't have tons of extra resources and don't have huge technical IT capacities. So our thought is, why don't we build things that like people can author on a laptop and do on a phone? Um, you know, let, let's 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 you know basically bring the technology demands of the system down as low as possible, as long as people still feel like they're having some kind of authentic experience. Um, and then the second is that when people make simulations, they often make things that try to get folks to practice the whole thing. Um, but it turns out that there's there's good cognitive science that suggests that when you ask novices to practice the whole thing, it's actually very difficult for them to get better at individual components. Um, if you want people to get better at things, have them practice parts of things. Um, this is why athletes don't do scrimmages all the time, they do drills. This is why musicians don't just play the whole piece all the time, they do scales and repeat pieces and they, they do other kinds of drills. Um, so we're trying to build like low tech, totally seamless front end experience, totally simple front end experience that does these sort of drill like simulations that might have tons of complexity on the back end that you're not exposed to and all kinds of interesting research capacity and things like that. Um, but the initial experience, you know, is simple, is straightforward, is authorable, is adaptable to different contexts, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and does just as much as it needs to do. Nice, nice. And this is just one project you're working on. I know. Yeah, <laughs> we, have a, we, have a, we have a big team. Well, that's fantastic. And uh, are you working on the uh, on your next book yet? You know, I'm not. Um, it, was, it was a lot to write one book. I I think I agreed to write the book in 2015, and I told them I would do it in 18 months. Um, and I did the final proofs of March of 2020. Um, the one, the next book that I'm thinking, or two books that I'm thinking, two two kinds of projects I'm thinking about. Um, one is in, in my lab, we make a bunch of online courses. Yeah. Um, I don't think it would be very hard to turn some of them to books because we put a lot of work into them already. Uh, like with Peter Senge, I wrote this, uh, we made this course called um, um, Launching Innovation in Schools. Um, sure. And uh, there's a lot of good stuff that's embedded in there. And I bet people would read it as a book. <laughs> you know, I would like sort of take a bunch of transcripts and stitch them together. The second project, um, there's a little bit of it. The second project sort of branches off the book a, a little bit, which is that um, when I, te I teach a bunch of classes, um, no one is an education student that I teach. Um, people often don't know much about education and learning. And usually the whole course is not just a primer of education and learning. So it's learning technique, you know, le learning media and technology, introduction to media studies, um, you know, technology design workshop. So, so most courses have something that, that starts with like a brief introduction to learning science. Um, and they're basically just two ideas, like to a first approximation, there are two ideas in learning science. Um, there are people who think that you learn by pouring stuff in their head 
And there are people who think that you learn through apprenticeship-like practice experiences. You know, in, in the 19th century in the United States, these sort of, you know, uh, uh, positions were epitomized by Edward Thorndike and John Dewey, but they're also captured like when Plutarch says something along the lines of, education is not the filling of a pail, but a lighting of a flame. There are a bunch of people who'd be like, nope, we have good science. It is also like, it is filling of a pail, or it is also like filling of a pail. Um, so I, th I think sort of explicating those two positions is interesting, but I also think those two positions are, are not just grounded in cognitive science, but they have a, a sort of moral philosophical dimension to them. Um, you know, so Rousseau, who had these ideas about, uh, you know, natural liberties and the noble savage and the dignity of primitivism and things like that, you know, was a big fan of apprenticeship kinds of models. Um, and, uh, um, you know, folks, folks who like um, sort of pale filling learning, they tend to really celebrate how learning is difficult. Um, and folks who like sort of natural apprenticeship learning like to celebrate how learning is easy. And of course, I'm sure everyone who's listening can think of a moment in which they learned something effortlessly and naturally, you know, the way they, 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 they sat next to their grandmother and learned her recipe for making tamales. And it was, and it was pleasant and it was joyable and it was seamless. And they can think of other things they could learn, you know, oftentimes in math class or something like that, where it required practice and revision and drafts and was painful. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's th those kind those kind of like, those affective dimensions get kind of woven into what are nominally sort of, um, you know, arguments about the structure of the brain and cognitive science and things like that. So that's another project that I'm thinking of trying to trying to weave together, you know, how, how these two perspectives are not just pedagogical perspectives, but they're, they're philosophical, they're effective, they're, uh, um, they're multidimensional. They're historically quite extensive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I don't know them as well in other kinds of cultures. Um, but, uh, you know, they, uh, um, you know, particularly in the West, these two ideas run very, very deep. I'd go back to uh, Frankenstein and you know, take a look at the education of the monster as well as the education of the um, But friends, I, I've got a couple of questions uh, for our, uh, our extremely energetic guest uh, to ask him about, uh, about his book and where he's headed. But then I'd love to hear more from, uh, from you. And we already have a couple of questions, but I just want to begin. What... Uh, oops. Uh, that it turns the uh, the technology useful, but not transformative, or that it's just it never scales up. Uh, and you have a whole series. The second half of your book is about all the all the reasons why the curse of data, the familiar, the problem, the familiar, and so on. Uh, I'm, I'm curious when you started working on this, uh, was that where you began, or did your view get darker and darker as you dug in? Um, well, I don't, I, I don't, I don't, my view isn't dark to me. Um, it's, uh, um, that technology has a role to play in improving schools. Um, there are two ways of thinking about that improvement. There may be more, but there are at least two. Um, one, uh, and my colleague Morgan Ames has a great book called, um, The Charisma Machine, about one laptop per child. And she defines this view of technology, um, as a sort of charismatic technology and charismatic technologists, which says new technologies will come and they will sweep away the future. Um, and they will, they will break down the errors and failings of the past and they le will lead us into a, into a very different kind of place. Um, and then there are also people who are more like tinkerers who say, no, 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 that's very silly. Um, educational institutions are incredibly complex. Um, they, balance this incredible diversity of competing incentives and stakeholders and needs. They're in a constant, um, delicate political balancing act. Mm -hmm. You know, our school systems, K through 20, they teach people to factor polynomials and to tie their shoes and to pay their taxes and to get a job and to throw a baseball um, and to criticize the government and to love your country and to not have sex, but if you do have sex, to do it in certain kinds of ways, and on and on and on and on, all these kinds of things that we ask schools to do. Um, and so 
it's silly to think that you're going to build something that's going to make a huge improvement across all of that because when you tug too hard on one part of that system, all the other parts of the system go, wait, 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 you're screwing up our parts of the system. This was all delicately balanced to meet all these competing needs. Um, but that's not to say that the system can't be improved. Um, it's very unlikely to be improved simply through the introductions of new technologies um, because every technology solution is a human capital problem. Um, every time you introduce some new tool or resource, it's not really useful for reasons we can get into until people have the time to develop new routines, new pedagogies, um, new supports, and not just teachers um, or faculty or instructors, but students and families and community members and IT staff and custodians and you know the whole range of, of people that make these systems work. Um, so to me, it's not dark in the sense of, I just think our, our celebration and our optimism is misplaced. I, 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 think, I think the charismatics have just been wrong over and over and over again. Um, and it's not, it's not neutral. Um, they architect these boom and bust cycles that have institutions over invest in new ideas. And then they get bored, you know, then the charismatics get bored once they're not the saviors anymore. And for the most part, they leave, but not all of them do. Um, some of them turn into tinkers. Um, and, you know, those systems are left behind. My, my MIT students right now um, are members of the smart board generation. Um, every year students come into my class, I ask them, tell me, tell me the story of the technology that you remember from your schools. And we've sort of finally hit the wave of students where their districts bought smart boards in middle school and high school. Yep. And nobody ever used them and they sat in closets or they just use as whiteboards and there's millions and millions of dollars that could have been done set productively to all kinds of other things sort of flushed away, um, which, you know, remain only as a memory in our students minds. Um, but I'm quite, but I'm quite optimistic that when people bring a kind of shoulder to the wheel mentality, you say, look, human development is hard. Um, the systems we work in are complex. They can be improved. They, they get better. Technology can be one thing that helps them get better, although almost never technology alone. Um, but this is good work to be doing. So, um, so for me, um, it's, not so, it's not so much painting a dark future. It's painting a cautionary tale about charismatic technologists who seem to be wrong over and over and over again um, and trying to really explain in detailed ways why. Um, and then give readers, you know, both the motivation to be tinkerers um, and then a set of tools that I think are useful for tinkerers and doing their work of, of making change. Well, thank you. That's an excellent, excellent answer. Um, and uh, I hope, well, already we're getting some responses and I'd like to uh, put these out for everybody. Um, just uh, really quickly, um, Fritz Vandover says that uh, charismatic technology seems to be brittle. Um, uh, you get some older folks with older technologies mentioned here, uh, ditto machines and microfiche, for example. But let me put up a couple of the first questions that we've got. Um, this is one uh, directly into a certain part of your book. Uh, this is from Jeff Alderson at uh, MathWorks. Hello, Jeff. Um, Jeff asks, I have a question for you about auto graders and computer programming. Page 29. What do you recommend in lieu of auto graders to assess students? Sure. So auto graders are pretty important to a bunch of models of learning at scale um, because scaling, um, scaling the dissemination of knowledge is not that hard. Um, we could record this talk. Anybody could watch it. Um, and they do. And they do. But if people wanted to learn, they would probably want some feedback on their comprehension and understanding. They want some way of knowing that what they've taken from the, from the discussion um, is being interpreted correctly or being reinterpreted in meaningful ways. And so you gotta give learners some feedback. Um, there are some domains in which we're pretty good at giving learners feedback. The problem is that those domains are things that computers are already good at. So um, when we ask humans to act like computers, when we ask them to do sort of routine, highly structured kinds of tasks, computers can evaluate them pretty well. They can evaluate computation and math. They can evaluate the conjugation of verbs, the pronunciation of words in early language acquisition. We don't have good auto graders that can assess whether or not um, you understand complex texts in a foreign language. Um, we can tell whether or not you've pronounced poor for war correctly. We can't tell whether or not you've had some meaningful interaction with Cervantes Don Quixote. 
Um, so, and also, you know, one of the, I call this the trap of routine assessment, which is that technologies are good at assessing things that we don't need human beings to do anymore. Um, and technologies are not particularly good at assessing the things where humans have a comparative advantage, where our education systems should be focusing. Um, so, you know, um, I, I hope, I, you know, I, I hope that sort of argument does two things. One is I hope splashes a whole bunch of cold water on the notion that like, right around the corner are these extremely powerful AI driven auto graders that are going to be able to reliably evaluate human performance in all kinds of different domains. Um, very, very smart people at wonderful institutions with millions and millions of dollars and the support of foundations and governments and the departments have worked on this problem for many years and have not made much progress. Um, the essay auto graders that, you know, sort of I first encountered 10 years ago, 20 years ago, the ones we have right now are like a little bit better, like, you know, in the way that Grammarly is better than, you know, the 1995 Microsoft Word grammar check, um, but not better in the sense that we still don't have machines that can tell whether or not a sentence that you've written, uh, you know, conveys meaning in a powerful way. Um, now, you know, however, all that said, we have auto graders that are good at some stuff. Um, you know, lots and lots of young kids and probably lots of uh, college students too, though I know a little bit less about this particular application, um, have used some kind of math tutoring software this year. Um, they haven't been able to go to physical buildings. They've had less access to their human teachers. And fortunately, people have made stuff like, you know, Alex and Dreambox and ST Math and all these other kinds of things. Um, and we can ask students to do computation kinds of things. Um, and the computers can go, yep, you've got that right, or no, you've got that wrong. Sometimes they can even go, no, you got that wrong because you don't understand this thing, go look here. Um, there's lots of things though in math that they can't evaluate really well. You know, one of the, thing, one of the things that we most want people to learn as they study mathematics throughout their career is to be able to articulate why they chose to solve a problem in a certain way, to be able to explain what the solution to a computation means in the context of the real world. You know, was it 37 kittens or 37 board feet or, you know, 37 um, uh, hot dogs? Um, we have much less good tools for that. But if you think about, again, what mathematicians actually do, um, you know, I, I, I do this much less, but I still periodically, you know, conduct statistical analyses and write papers and things like that. Um, the computer does all the computation for me. I figure out what problem is interesting. I figure out how to set up and frame the problem. I explain what the computations mean and what their significance is. Um, but, you know, I let the computers do the computer stuff. Um, so there's, you know, there's going to be a role for auto graders. Um, the thing to avoid is two things to avoid are being seduced into believing that the things that we can auto grade are the important things for people to learn. Um, in many cases, they're good building blocks, but they're not the whole field. I'll give you a second example, which some of you may enjoy. Um, we have real, probably the best auto graders that we have are in computer programming. So I could ask you, Brian, to write a computer program that performs a task. Sure. And then I could write a computer program that could evaluate whether or not you've met engineering requirements, whether or not the, the syntax and formatting is right, um, certain kinds of errors. There's a professor at, um, uh, at MIT of computer science named Hal Abelson. Sure. Um, who wrote uh, a beautiful line, which is something like, computer programs are communications between humans about methodology that only incidentally can be run by computers. Um, if you believe that to be the case about computer programs, then our auto graders don't measure that at all. Um, you know, what, what Hal is talking about is like, are, you know, are the structures that you're choosing, the way that you're naming variables, the way that you're commenting code, um, are you really communicating something about methodology to another person? Um, and so, you know, even in domains which our auto graders are best, we're still not teaching people the thing, we're still not evaluating the things that people need to be a really great software engineer, a really great collaborator on a software project. Um, but, like, these things are helpful. You know, like, the, the technologies that we build are useful for certain parts of certain subjects, for certain students in certain contexts. And we should use them wherever they're useful, and we should not be seduced into believing that they're, you know, sweeping solutions. Hello, Jeff. Hi, Brian. Hi, Jeff. 
Hi, Justin. So first off, I don't know if you can see this. I've got your book literally in my hand, so I'm not bluffing. Um, but but I know. But as Brian knows, I've been on. I've been asked to join the stage a couple of times. Um, actually, I'm looking at us now. I think I'm the COVID after six months. Justin, you're the COVID after one year. Brian, you're the COVID after ten years. God forbid. Um, so like so I'm happy, happy to join. Sorry. Happy to join the Beard panel today. So let me give you the context for why I asked the question I did. So I'm. I'm currently the product manager for MATLAB Grader, which is an auto grading solution for MATLAB code at MathWorks. MIT is our one of our largest users of that auto grading solution. Your colleagues swear by this product in their in their classes, and I'm also enrolled as a graduate student full time at University of Illinois for my Master's of Education, and I'm focusing on learning technologies. And when I was in a discussion in my class, someone says, "Hey, Justin." Um, you know, right has this great book that's challenging some of the assumptions that you're making about your product management. And I said, uh oh. And so I read the book and I'm in the chapter and I get to this heading where you're literally put me and my work in the crosshairs. But the good news is I actually want to want to give you an open invitation. The next iteration you do on this book, I would love to invite you to talk with the folks at MIT that are using our auto grading solution, because I think we actually are onto something. And, and I want to sp specifically focus on what you said, which was the other stuff that auto graders aren't evaluating, but have to do with the intent, have to do with the learning objective. What was the behavioral things you're trying to check? The, the, skill, the mastery of skills about computer prog programming and software engineering that can't be just gleaned from the syntax, but they could maybe be implied by the syntax and need follow-up and discussion. And, and so I guess the way I was, I, the re reason I asked you the question is in, on top of auto grading, is there another potential for automation or something at scale that could get at the heart of that? What's, what's missing? And as a product manager, what should I be focused on to take the next step beyond auto grading and look to automatically assess the behavioral intent and the learning objectives? Mm. Yeah, um, that, that's a great question. Um, you know, and I and I hope that one thing that people take away from the from the book, uh, you know, two things. One is that there are all kinds of good uses of auto graders. Um, there are, you know, um, one thing I focus on a bunch is uh, computational assessment of pronunciation for language learning. You know, I mean, I have this sort of vision in my head of when you know a Spanish teacher would go around the room and we would all say "por favor." Um, you know, and the Spanish team would like tap me on the head and be like, eh, I don't think so, but would move on, you know, because she doesn't want to spend um, five or 10 minutes just having you pronounce it slightly more right over and over again. But computers will do that. They'll just sit there and listen to you over and over again, mispronounce por favor, you know, coach you again, uh, kind of infinitely. Um, and I also think that instructional designers can do what I would sound or, or project managers can do what it sounds like you're doing, which is continuing to think about um, how are we going to expand the domains of what it's possible to assess? Um, and, you know, the example that I use for that in the book is some colleagues at MIT um, who are getting ready to teach a calculus class. And they said, we're not going to teach this class until students can draw curves. Um, it's just too important to be able to, you know, to, to do the sort of conceptual work that's involved in, in you know, in, in drawing curves and where they cross the x-axis and y-axis and things like that. Um, and we could do it with multiple choice questions, but that's not good enough. We have to be able to draw curves. Um, when they built that tool that drew curves, which took a lot of time and was was complex but worked very well, like they sort of slightly expanded. They sort of you know that's kind of the way through the trap of routine assessment. They kind of slightly expanded um, what was possible. You know, you've got a big team full of smart engineers at MathWorks. I'm sure day after day, you're sort of slightly expanding the domain um, of what's possible um, and, and pushing, you know, um, every, every assessment you know, by definition is sampling from a domain. Um, and you're making that sample sort of broad. You know, my argument is that the things that we're sampling are often not the most important things. Mm -hmm. Um, and you're continuing to try to expand that sample, you know, for someone who's sort of looking at the field of, of education technology broadly, um, those expansions are unlikely to help students, um, you know, who are, who are in, in a writing class or in a law class or, you know, in a poetry class or in a biology class. They're just very particular. Like your team is going to you know, spend gazillions of dollars and do tons of great work. 
and you're going to keep sort of slowly expanding what's possible. You know, it's unlikely that you're going to develop the sort of generalized AI that solves all these problems for everything. Um, all of that is great and worthy work. You know, I think of that as sort of great tinkering work. Um, and the important thing for institutions to do is to keep auditing where that Mm -hmm. so where that where that sample from the domain is and to not be lulled into thinking that the sample is the whole domain is to say look if these are things that that the mathworks auto grader doesn't evaluate right now where in our program are we teaching these really important things to students and you know how are we you know paying people fairly at reasonable wages to be able to help other students learn that stuff you know i i i am optimistic about the notion that um there is more time for educators to focus on the things that they do best if you're building us some auto graders that that capture some things that computers happen to be good at doing mm -hmm. um and even uh you know i mean I, you know the, the uh, mit has also adopted i think it's grade scope or something like that which is mm -hmm. you have to pass an animal to each other through the internet we, we can do this through the <laughs> I just I just saw Brian holding up one cat and then it disappeared and I saw Jeff pick up another cat um, and it looked very much the same. So uh, um, you know it's a it's a tool that it was built for huge classes and it just lets you sort of scan in test answers so people can grade them a little bit more easily. Um, yeah. It's fun. Like those are all good things to do. And um, we just have to we can't confuse those like pretty good tinkering incremental improvements. Um, for the disruption of higher education. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate that context. And it's one thing we actually ask our customers to help us with is to prove that our auto grading solution is as good or better than what they used to do to assess the same learning objectives and outcomes. And if we're able to, in a statistically valid way, show that our auto grading solution is doing the same things they used to do, but at scale, then and only then will we move on to the next thing. Right, like we we want to take those incremental improvements, but we don't want to like jump into such new territory that they've never tried to assess before. That's not, you know, we can't auto grade some new concept that they've never tried to even understand behaviorally or from a learning objective or a prerequisite skills perspective. They, they, we don't we don't want to go into those territories. We want to show that we can grade things faster, more efficiently than that, and, and prove that it works as good as what they used to do. Um, but no, I appreciate I appreciate that context and thank you for the the answers and the time. No, yeah, thanks. And if folks at MathWorks want to talk about this stuff more, I'd be happy to. Thank you, Jeff, for the really good no problem. Uh, and uh, Justin, thank you for the very, very rich answer. Uh, friends, if you're new to the forum, that's an example of a video question. It literally is uh, that easy to do. Uh, let me just now share some of the text questions as well. Uh, and uh, let's see, one comes from another close reader. Uh, this is from Kate Montgomery at uh, SMU. And Kate asks, uh, you say that institutions and investors often favor programs to scale up quickly, but at the expense of true innovation. How is true innovation defined? I'll put that up on the screen again so people can see it. I don't know. <laughs> if you're quoting directly to the book, I don't remember that sentence anymore. Um, I, um, here's, here's what I hope it means, but then someone can go back to the text and tell me if I did it wrong. Um, you know, one of the phenomena I talk about is uh, is I call the curse of the familiar, um, and the uh, the you know one way to frame the curse of the familiar is if you look at the history of education technology, the thing that people do most commonly is they use new technologies to extend existing practices. So they use new technology to do whatever it is they were doing before, like a little bit faster, maybe a little bit more efficiently. Um, if you look at the technologies that are most widely adopted, you know one example I use is in K twelve. Um, one of the most widely used technologies by like half of all high school students, I'm sure it's used by lots of higher education students too, is this tool called Quizlet, which was made by a by an MIT dropout or an MIT you know industrial graduate or whatever you want to call that. Um, and, you know, and if I, most of you probably know what Quizlet is. If you don't, it makes digital flashcards. Um, it uh, has you know questions. As soon as you glance at it, you'll know exactly what it is. The flashcard app. You, you'll have questions on one side, answers on the other, terms on one side, definitions on the other. You can practice. Um, adopted very, very widely, very, very quickly um, because it let people do a kind of thing they were doing before. If we grabbed a whole bunch of educational experts and pulled them together around a table and said like, what do we really need in K-12 and higher education? What do we need for the future? What do we really need to move things forward? If you, if you, had, not, if you had 60 years of, of future trends forum, 
I'm pretty sure that not a single expert would raise their hand and go, you know what, we have a real flashcard deficit in our schools. Um, you know, the thing that we're up against is there, there are not enough index cards. We can't write definitions on them fast enough. This is what's really holding us back. Um, so I, don't, I think what I mean by true innovation in that context um, is that the tools that most readily spread and scale are the things that let us do what it is that we're already doing. But the, but the trap of that is if we simply do flashcards a little faster and memorization a little faster, that's not going to reduce the yawning gaps in equity that we have. That's not going to you know, help our six-year graduation rates that much. That's not going to um, you know, rearrange the iron triangle of, of cost, access, and quality. Um, by contrast, when we build technologies that seem like, wow, this could be a really different way of teaching and learning. Like there could be some real advantages that would prepare people for the world in the ways that you know, universities anchored in the medieval times might not be able to. Most people find them confusing. Um, you know, when you looked at like the original massive open online courses that came out in 2008 that sort of borrowed from these network learning environments, super cool, super interesting, really exciting, really neat technologies. And most people look at them and like, what am I supposed to do here? This is weird. Um, and we're really hard for people to persist in. In the K-12 space, you know, a similar sort of phenomenon happens around the Scratch programming language. Mm -hmm. So Mitch Resnick and his colleagues at MIT um, build this incredible new community, this incredible new programming language for creative computing. Um, that asks for really different relationships between teachers and students, really different use of time, really different ways of evaluation. And so most schools, if they do adopt Scratch, they're like, all right, we're not gonna do that part actually. We're just gonna give students a recipe and we're gonna have them all make the same computer program. Um, so, uh, um, you know, that, that's, that's the curse of the familiar. It, seem, it seems to be difficult to navigate between what Kate referenced, you know, just generating things that, that do what we're already doing a little bit faster that probably won't make that much of a difference or generating really new things that are hard for people to adopt. The pathway through, by the way, there seem to be two parts of it as far as I can tell. Yeah. Building things that start in the familiar and right. then lead you to really new kinds of practices. Um, Desmos is an online graphing calculator that I think has done that really well. When you first encounter it, you're like, oh, this does everything my TI-82 does, but for free. And then as you get into it more, you're like, this is a completely different way for students to learn modeling and math. There's sort of a pathway for the familiar to something um, more ambitious. Um, and then it's not about scaling distribution, it's about scaling community. If you have a thing that's gonna help people do teaching and learning really differently, they're not gonna learn those strategies just from your technology. They're gonna learn those strategies from being in community with other people. Now everyone's gonna be graphing away at this and, and the questions will drop. So I have to, you have to be careful here. Um, that's, a, uh, that's a really good distinction between the strange and the familiar here. Uh, we have more questions come in that build on this. Uh, one, I think, comes from Kiel Deutsch. Uh, it seems like most colleges just look the overused classroom lecture model for online learning, and they ignore the real value of the internet. It's a rich trove of books, articles, videos, podcasts, and stuff. That's not a question. That's a comment. Yeah, I think that I think the challenge of that is that um, if you treat the internet just as a rich trove even in some of the way that like MOOCs and other things have done, like, look, here's a course, come and take it. It's, you know, the same thing that we offered at MIT or Harvard or whatever other great university you think it is. Um, most people are really struggle with self-directed learning. Uh, maybe one way to qualify that is when people learn things that have an immediate, that are immediate concern to them and are of high interest, they're actually incredibly good at learning online. So if you wanna learn new ways to style your hair, to do your makeup, to um, do a trick on a skateboard, to beat a level in a video game, um, people from all kinds of different backgrounds, all kinds of walks of life, all kinds of ages are quite proficient at that kind of learning. When we ask people to do things that look like school, um, where you sort of have to like grind through some stuff that seems kind of abstract for a while for a longer payoff, many folks are not nearly as good at doing that. Um, so, uh, um, you know, um, and, and the people who are really good at that tend to be people who have had a great apprenticeship in the formal education system. Um, it, you know, I don't, I don't, I won't, I won't say I know this for sure from science, but if you want my current best bet, the best way to become a really good autodidact is to have a really good apprenticeship in the formal education system, which means that if we treat the internet as a rich trove of resources, the people who will benefit from it most 
are already educated, already affluent folks. Um, so we do need models um, that recognize that people don't just need a rich trove. They need supports, they need peers, they need teachers, they need structure, they need guidance, some of which traditional lecture kind of courses offer. But certainly I think more of our higher education institutions should be should be deliberate about building pathways. You know, by the time you leave this program, you shouldn't have just learned some stuff. You should feel like you've had some practice with some some mentorship and support at learning more about this stuff on your own. That's a good answer. Um, and it makes me think of uh, quite a few things involving MOOCs, uh, especially the X MOOCs that you uh, address so well. Uh, well, building on the autodidact aspect, um, let's uh, bring up a question from uh, Adib Saeed, uh, who asks, what are your thoughts on alternative education, such as homeschooling, unschooling, and we just heard self-directed education, et cetera? Well, man, you know, an amazing thing that we learned during the pandemic is there are a lot, of, there are a lot more students who might be interested in some of these approaches than maybe we thought, um, in particular, amongst our most vulnerable students you know there there are lots of reports but uh, you know there, this hasn't gone into quantitative science i don't think but but there's lots of really strong journalistic and qualitative reports that say you know in k-12 there's a bunch of students who went to schools every day where they experienced a bunch of racism um and then they didn't have to go into those buildings anymore and they really liked learning better um you know in the loving arms of their homes and their families um but the you know the, these things homeschooling, independent learning, self-directed learning, like all, you know, all that stuff is good. Um, our, our public education systems are a gem and a treasure and, you know, and, and maybe we should supplement them with these more distributed options, but there's something enormously powerful about having places where people go to build community and learn together. You know, even if a lot of that building, you know, even for, for higher education institutions that are moving more online, um, you know, I do, I do think we want a kind of federated system that has different options for different people because different folks are different. Um, but, but I'm, but I'm not at all enthusiastic. To some extent, I've never been enthusiastic about this sort of like highly, these sort of models of highly personalized learning where we're going to algorithmically optimize each student's individual pathway through learning experiences in part, because I got my career started as a ninth grade history teacher. Um, and, there, you know, what I wanted more than anything else was kids with as different brains as possible. And you have, there are lots of ways of getting different brains, but having different backgrounds and different life experiences is one great way of having different brains. Sure. Having different brains read the same stuff at the same time and be in the same space with each other to talk about them. You know, I want them to read the Mayflower Compact or the letter from a Birmingham jail um, and just sit with each other and wrestle with what it might have meant to the people at that time, what it means to them now, what it means differently to each other because we have different life experiences. And there's no algorithmic way to optimize through that faster. Um, it's, uh, you know, one way I think about it is that there's some parts of learning in which might feel like, you know, the joy of learning is maybe like a jazz musician or something like that, where you're kind of doing your own thing, maybe doing your own thing with a couple of other people, but a lot of the learning experiences we value most are like an orchestra. Um, and even if the second violin has mastered their part, you still just sit there and you play your part over and over again so the tuba can get it, and the trombone can get it, and whoever else needs it can get it. Um, because the, you know, the transcendent experience is when you all play that together. Um, and uh, you know, um, so that, that's, that's where some of my concerns about um, um, so, you know, Adib has a great point in the chat that like many homeschoolers and unschoolers create vibrant local communities that are more natural than the weird things that we do. I think that's right. I think there's lots that we can learn from those institutions. There's sort of cross pollination. Um, but I also think that some of the most vociferous advocates of these kinds of things are also sort of uh, advocates of free market approaches to learning who, who see online learning, who see homeschooling, who see unschooling, who see virtual schooling as ways of breaking the social contract that we've had for, you know, in various ways in higher education for 60 years and um, 150 years in K-12 education of communities educating people together. Well, speaking of time, we're coming close to the uh, end of our hour and I wanna make sure that everyone gets a chance to uh, uh, weigh in with their questions and comments. So now if you have one that's burning up in your mind, friends, this is a great time to put it in. Uh, we have one from uh, Michael Fried at uh, Ithaca SNR, and let me just bring this up. Is there a risk of veering the curriculum or course content 
to what the technology is good at supporting its scale instead of what is important to learn? If so, how can that risk be mitigated? Yes, that is that is an, an excellent. So if you turn the first if you turn the first question into a statement, yes, um, we over anchor on what we can assess on what we can deliver online rather than what's really important. Um, the answer to that is to have as our ongoing mantra over and over and over again that technology needs to be in the service of learning. That we think about learning first and where we want people to end up, and then we look at the technologies that we have. Um, and if we're educators, we say, which of these helps meet our learning goals? Um, if we're technology developers, we say, what are really important learning goals um, that whose needs aren't being met by technologies? And let's try to build those kinds of things. Um, financially, that's actually quite difficult to do because if there's something for which, um, you know, is not happening as well as it should have, it probably doesn't have a particularly big market because um, that needs to be sort of generated at the same time. Um, but, uh, you know, I, uh, um, yeah, the, the way we do it is by is by having learning be in the service uh, by having technology be in the service of learning. The one of the challenges with that is for whatever reason, technology like takes up a ton of logistical brain space in people's minds. You can start it. You can start a conversation where learning and technology are in balance, and all of a sudden, you're finding yourself talking about like software licenses and logins and single sign-on and where the chargers go um, and all these other kind of logistical questions. You've just, you've just gone sort of further and further down this path. And then you kind of look around and be like, how did we stop talking about learning? Um, how did we, you know, institutionally, how do we totally lose track of where we are? Um, and it's very, very common in all kinds of schools. They're extremely well resourced. Schools that are poorly resourced. You know, elementary schools, higher education institutions. It's a very, very common pattern. Um, and so, part of it is a discipline of you know constantly asking ourselves the questions like you know, what are the learning goals we have for students? What are the students' goals that they have for themselves? What's the technology infrastructure that we're buying that we're building? You know, is it aligned with those goals? And how do we prevent ourselves? When I ever I think of this, I think of the old Far Side cartoon of um, uh, where the Neanderthals in class and raises his hand and said, excuse me, ma'am, can I go home? My brain is full. Um, technology somehow does the brain is full. Uh, in the chat, uh, Carolyn Coward at uh, JPL says that uh, she finds technology takes up a lot of emotional brain space. And, uh, and if, if we furiously agree about that, then we, we prove the point. Uh, but, That's right. Uh, thank you for uh, it's a really good question um, and, and thank you again for that uh, Justin uh, we have another question that comes off of the technology angle uh, this is from Carolyn uh, how is the ed tech space combating hidden but systemic bias in artificial intelligence and the algorithms that drive many of our automated systems it's not it's not um, you know one of the things that I don't know my students and I have just been reading um, the age of surveillance capitalism by uh, and one of the things that um, that she says, you know, over and over again, is that, you know, it's it's it, it, it's in the interest of technology companies to make what they're doing as obtuse and abstract as possible, um, because they're trying to do things in places in which there aren't cultural norms or laws or regulations, and so the more quietly they do it, um, the deeper their incursions can go. I'll tell you what we think the solution is. So as I mentioned to you before. Um, we have, uh, um, you know, we, ha we have a project to build this digital clinical simulation tool and we're actually building an artificially intelligent coaching agents in it. That, you know, things that say like, recognize when you sound confused or hesitant and say, hey, um, Brian, you sound a little hesitant there. Do you wanna try that one again? Here are three sentence stems that might help. Um, hey. Part of what we wanna do, we haven't gotten there yet, but part of what we wanna do in the build is also just like expose that whole process to people. Um, to be like, hey, remember those little nudges you got? Like, you know, if you want to find out more about where they came from, here's how we program them. Here's how we tested them on. Um, how did it feel to be um, supported by an intelligent agent? What concerns do you have? Um, a lot, you know, in a lot of consumer technologies, we want the technology experience to be seamless. Um, I just got a new electric car. When I sit down in the electric car, like I don't want, I don't want to confront it. Um, you know, starting to use my phone as a sound system. I just want it to work and go away. I think in education we do want to trip over and encounter our learning technology systems. I do think we want to have rougher experiences there where we go, oh, um, we are using AI. 
Um, how did it get trained? Who are these people? Why is it doing it to me? Um, how do I have an opportunity to make input on my choices and things like that? Um, so that I, you know, that doesn't give you all the answers. I also have a couple of great colleagues at uh, MIT who are, you know, not to not to be an advertisement for my institution today, but um, who are trying to do more stuff in AI and education and help people, especially young folks, start understanding better how it works. There's uh, a uh, there's a thing in uh, in German called uh, I believe Stolpersteinen, um, which means stumble stones. And this is when you have a cobblestone road and you take one of the cobbles, you rotate it 90 degrees. So that when you're walking along, you hit it and you immediately look down. And people have used it for ads, eat at Hans, um, but also for history. Uh, you know, this happened in place. And I wonder about technology like that. But we have a metaphor. It's a great metaphor, Brian. It's That's a exactly what I mean. It's a, it's a wonderful uh, idea. But it does lead to bruised toes, which is also part of it. Uh, we have a. Uh, uh, one question from uh, Michelle Denise Miller, who was a great guest, who also has a wonderful book. Uh, Michelle says, even as a fan of ed tech generally, I'm still constantly struck by the gap between the promise and the reality of what's actually possible. Thoughts on the major reasons why this gap persists? Uh, you know, I mean, people fund promise and reality is hard. Um, you know, I, I think one of the things that I try to articulate in the book is that those many of the promise reality gaps that we experience are not for lack of effort. Um, you know, in, in, in MOOCs, I made this, you know, one of the promises of MOOCs was that we were going to generate a new data driven science of education that just like the genome project revolutionized medicine, um, that, uh, that it, MOOCs would be a kind of genome project, um, you know, that would, that would dramatically change teaching and learning. And it hasn't. Um, and it's, um, but not because the promise was totally crazy. It's kind of, it, to me, it still on its face seems like a reasonable analogy and might have been possible. And not because we didn't try. Um, I mean, I feel like I've worked with like literally hundreds of colleagues at dozens of institutions with millions and millions of dollars trying to tackle this problem. Um, and I don't think we made a lot of progress because the challenge is hard. Um, uh, that's what, that's the thing that I come back to over and over again, it, you know, you think about the complexity of our institutions. You think about the granularity of the work that we do. Like today, somewhere in this country, there's a seventh grade earth science teacher who is starting a unit on plate tectonics. Let's say you want to make a technology that makes formative assessment a little better. Well, what formative assessment on the first day of a unit on plate tectonics in the seventh grade looks like is different than what formative assessment looks like in a Spanish four class to a, um, a graduating senior at a four year institution is different than what it looks like to a computer science student who's doing their first lab practicum. Um, and it's different, you know, within, like, within each of our units, within each of the days of our units, the, the granularity of the work that we're doing in teaching and learning is so fine. Um, that it's very hard to build things that are useful when you're trying to help people learn how to tie their shoes and to have sex safely uh, and to criticize the government and, and to conjugate Arabic verbs and everything else that we ask people to do. Um, that's why it's hard. But each of those things that I just described is just so immensely valuable yes. that they're all worth doing too. You know, it's worth keeping our shoulder to the wheel, try to work on this stuff. Um, but we have to be realistic about what can be accomplished. And we have to recognize that there's just a bunch of financial incentives in the system for people to promise it's the moon. And it's not helpful when they do that. And it's not helpful when we believe them. Um, and so, you know, I, I joined the ongoing uh, uh, quixotic effort of trying to get my colleagues to, you know, my colleagues on the tech development side to stop doing that. My colleagues on the education side to um, bring a healthy skepticism combined with the fact that like, if we tinker together, we can totally make these systems better. Um, if we tinker together. Um, I, I, I hate to pause you on this, uh, but we just shot past the uh, end of our hour. That's a fantastic note to end on. Sounds great. We're kind of like a tinkering and, uh, and a uh, marriage counselor at the same time. Uh, just in, what are the best ways for people to keep up with you? Is it uh, uh, you're uh, uh, on Twitter or should we? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm at BJFR on Twitter. If you go to the, our website, tsl.mit.edu, we send out a newsletter. Um, oh, good. And uh, um, so sign up there. 
those those are those are those are the places that we that we publish stuff. These I don't know you can set up a Google alert for my name, but uh, <laughs> but that's not what I'll do. That's what I do. Not what I say what you all would do. Well, that that works very well. And uh, some people have been tweeting at you uh, during uh, during this event, and you probably get more uh, uh, more Twitter questions and comments as we go. Thank you for uh, an incredibly uh, nuanced, uh, deep, and very inspiring uh, discussion. I really Thanks for having me, Brian. It was a pleasure. Oh, pleasure. But don't go it's away, friends. Audience as well. We're going to bring you back next time. But let me tell you what's happening for the next few weeks. Um, looking ahead, we're going to continue our exploration of technology and academia. Again, we're going to be looking at sparking emerging ed tech conversations, how to improve equity and education for black students, uh, federal policy changes, and a lot more. So just go to forum.futureofeducation.us. Now, if you'd like to uh, continue discussing these issues, Honestly, I think right now Twitter is the best one. Uh, we haven't seen a lot of people using our Facebook or LinkedIn uh, pages, um, so I may just sunset those, but please uh, use the hashtag FTTE. Uh, if you'd like to look back into the past, into, uh, including some of the sessions that we've already evoked today, uh, please go to, uh, to uh, our archive on YouTube. You can find that at tinyurl.com slash FTF archive. And uh, as you proceed, as you wrap up the spring semester, as you think about the summer, as you think about the fall, I hope all of these discussions have been of use to you all. I really appreciate all of your comments, all of your questions today. It's been a pleasure to think through all this together with you. And in the meantime, stay safe, take care, and we'll see you online. Bye-bye. <laughs>